everybody. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was going to go ahead and let you guys know, um, on your table, for those of you that are new, there is an index card that's on there. We have got the memory verse up here. Um, if you guys want to take the time while we're waiting on people to come in and get seated to go ahead and start writing your memory verse down, these are really, really good to carry around with you and to just have whenever you need um, need to study or you just need a word from God for the day. So just, you know, get them written down. And as soon as everybody gets seated, um, Julie will be up here to get started. All right, let's get started. Who's got their memory verse written down? Getting there. Marquita, how's your table doing? All right, hey guys, it's, uh, what are we at, week eight? Eight weeks into John, and we're just rolling along. Uh, if this is your first time, no worries, because you'll catch up in a heartbeat. I always review every single week, and tonight is no exception. Um, we've got a sheet in front of us, and we will go through this together, but I just want you to be able to see how much you've learned when you go through this worksheet. How much you've learned, I think you'll be stunned. Um, Remember me telling you a few weeks ago that Billy Graham said one of his biggest regrets is that he didn't memorize more scripture? And I was talking with a friend a few minutes ago, and I asked her, you know, what would your future self say to you if you chose to do this particular thing? And, you know, I make that question to you guys. If a year from now, you can look back on this date and see that you've memorized 21 scriptures that you can pray over people, you can decree, you can change the atmosphere, how much better would your spiritual life be? You know, what would your future self tell you if they could turn around right now? Do it, right? Just do it. And that's how I continue to encourage you, memorize these. I've got it on a continual loop on a voice app where literally I, it just loops over and over me reciting a scripture and I say it with it over and over. And that's how I'm learning these. So let's, uh, let's go to John 1. The key word for John 1 is son. Help me out here. We're going to do 114 and the word. word became flesh and dwelt us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So what John's saying there is, guys, I'm writing this because I have seen the son of God and I've touched him. I saw him, I witnessed it, and that's why I'm writing this. So that's what that scripture means. John chapter 1 was all about the word was in the beginning. It's also we met John the Baptist, and the first disciples were introduced in John 1. Let's move on. John 2. What's our key word for John 2? Do. Do. What's our missing word in this scripture, John 2, 5? Do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. I say he would say that to us too. Right, Sabrina? In chapter 2, we looked at the wedding at Cana where Jesus turned the water into wine. That was his first sign or miracle that John pointed out. And then Jesus also clears the marketplace inside the temple. That's what we saw in chapter 2. Let's look at John 3. What's our key word for John 3? Believe. What are our missing words? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3, we see Nicodemus visiting Jesus in the evening hours, and we also see the disciples baptizing. John 4, what's our key word for John 4? Restore. Good. What is our missing words in 424? God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Good job. John 4, we look at the woman at the well, and we also see the royal official's son healed, and that's the second sign miracle that John shows us in the gospel of John. John 5, what's our key word for John 5? Rise, because he healed the lame man, and he rose and carried his mat. John 5, 19, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing for whatever the father does that the 
son does likewise. John 5, we looked at the lame man healed by the pool. That's our third sign that we see in the Gospel of John. And then we also see Jesus basically telling the religious authorities that God is his father. Explaining to the authorities who he is and that he can only do what he sees his father doing. John 6, what's our key word there? Fix, because he's fixing a meal for these people. John 6, 63, what's our missing word? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. In John 6, we looked at the feeding of the 5,000. We've got five loaves and two fishes. And then we move on and see Jesus walking on water. And then we also see the very difficult part of John 6 where Jesus calls himself the bread of life. And that makes sense. But when he has to tell these people they must eat his flesh and drink his blood, well, that became a little difficult for a lot of those people. So we see a lot of disciples exit the scene in John 6. John 7. What's our key word for John 7? It's actually 11. I, Chris put that wrong. 7-Eleven, because where do you go to get a drink? <laughs> I like it. It's very true. I love it. To quench your thirst, exactly. So, John seven thirty eight. whoever believes in me, good, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. John 7, we looked at it last week, it was the Feast of Tabernacles, and then you see Jesus saying, if anyone is thirsty, come to me, because I'm the living water. All right, moving to our chapter that we're going to look at today, John 8, crazy word, but the word we're going to have here is hate. Hate. It's where they have the adulterous woman, and they were saying very hateful things about her. Hate. John 8, hate. Let's look at our memory verse. Our memory verse is, if you abide in me, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Good job, guys. Let's pray this in. Let's let Sabrina take over, and we've got a great lesson going on tonight. Father, thank you for these disciples, God, who are abiding in your word here tonight, God. Thank you, Father, that we will know the truth, and the truth will set us free. I just pray wisdom and knowledge upon Sabrina, and I pray that we all have a receptive ears and receptive heart to receive what she says. Holy Spirit, do your thing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> By the way, if you guys haven't noticed, we do have two people missing tonight, Chris and Emily. Um, they had their baby today, little girl and Faith. He was supposed to send me a picture to share, but he did not. So I was going to share the one he sent, and he said absolutely no. <laughs> so I was like, okay. But he didn't get to send it to me. But, um, but yeah, eight pounds, four ounces, big old girl for such a tiny mama. So um you guys think about it, congratulate them, you know, and just kind of send them some love. All right. You guys ready to get into this? John chapter 8. This is a um, chapter that I can honestly say was probably the most difficult study I have ever had to do because all it is is people arguing. That's all it is. So um, you will literally see the Pharisees were some hateful people. They were. And you will see that throughout all of this. I want to read you really quick a little bit from Chris's lesson last week from John 7. Like Julie was saying a minute ago, it did take place at the Feast of Tabernacles or the Festival of Booths. Um, it, uh, Jesus was accused of having a demon. That's always fun. Um, in verse 31, um, it states that many of the people believed because what they saw um, in his boldness in the temple. Um, Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit, that all who believe in him will receive. Um, when they sent the officers after him to um, arrest him, even they came back empty-handed and said, we've never seen somebody speak like this man. They wouldn't even arrest him because of the way that he spoke. Um, this leads up to where we're at now. The Pharisees are doing anything that they can right now to try to trap Jesus. And so in that is where we kind of enter in to... Um, John 8. We are still in Jerusalem. It is still the time um, of the festival of the tabernacles. And so it's all, it's literally the, John 8 is the next day out of John 7. So we're going to start off reading 1 through 11, and then we're going to go back and break this up a little bit. 
One of the things I want to point out here is, is um, in the original manuscript, I think uh, Chris said something about this last week, but in the original manuscript, uh, 753 through 811 is actually not even included in the, the past. Um, it didn't actually come in until, I want to say they said, like, they began to bring it into the Word in 100 AD, somewhere in that era. Um, but the reason that they... Augustine says, I kind of searched through this today because I was trying to figure out why did they not have it in the original, but Augustine says that it was, the story was removed from the gospel because it was like a, almost like a slight of faith and to avoid the scandal because it was an adulterous woman, and Jesus forgives her, and they were looking at it as it'll make light of the situation, and it'll be okay for people to do this, so that's one of the reasons they left it out. They brought it back in um, at one, at, when they did because the the um, rulers of the church began to get, they were being like very harsh. They were going back to that, just that harsh, being very mean, you know, to people that were going through this. And so they brought it back in to show God does forgive, you know, the things that we do. So I want to go ahead and start with one. It says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Um, some of the scholars say this is possibly where his tent was pitched for the, for the um, festival. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple and all the people came to him. He sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman to him who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, the Torah, um, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him that they might um, have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground, and a lot of versions say as though he did not hear them. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and he wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones and then to the younger. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. So after the debating and the Pharisees wanting Jesus taken into custody, you know, of course, they're trying to figure out a way to kind of trap him a little bit. They're going to see if they can get him to bend the, bend the law as they, as they believe. Um, they, were, uh, bring this, they brought this woman before him. In, in, the, in their law, in order, whenever you have like a really big issue, it came before the rabbis. You brought all of that stuff before the rabbis. So they were bringing her to Jesus as a rabbi, as a teacher, as a leader. And um, they wanted to challenge him to see if he would mess up with the, with the accusation. And uh, adultery was one of the three gravest sins, according to the Jews, and was punishable by death. In Leviticus 20.10 and Deuteronomy 22.13 and 14, that gives, it gave them directions of how to carry out the punishment for that. And it actually does say, in both of those, I went back and read them, it actually does say that the man and the woman is to be punished. So why they just brought the woman to them, I do not know. I still think it was just part of that trap. Um, so they were right in what they were wanting to do. It wasn't that, the, that they were like, you know, testing him to see if he knew the law. So when he stooped down and he wrote in the dirt, um, it said, a lot of versions said that it, it was as though he didn't hear them. To this day, nobody knows what he wrote. I mean, you can go through commentary after commentary, and everybody has their own ideas of what he wrote. And I took a few of them down because it just seemed interesting to me. My favorite one is, um, is the one about him act, acting as if he didn't hear them. Um, the three ideas could be this. Um, he simply wished to gain some time, not to be rushed. He needed to think through, maybe talk to God a little bit and say, you know, what do you want done here? You know, what, what's, what's your answer in this? Um, some manuscripts, as I said before, add that though he did not hear them. So he may have been um, forcing the scribes and Pharisees to repeat their charges so that they might become aware of the cruelty of how they're acting. So he bent down and he's writing, you know, just writing in the dirt. The Aramean translates, um, er, oh, sorry, the Armenian, I cannot say that word, translates, there you go, the passage this way. It says, he himself, bowing his head, was writing with his finger on the earth to declare their sins, and they were seeing their several sins on the stones. So Jesus could have been writing in the dust the very accusations of what, you know, the things that they have also done in the past. Um, the normal Greek word for to write is the word graphian, but here the word used is 
katagraphian, which means to write down a record against somebody. So one of the meanings of kata is against. So in Job 13, 26, it says, you write, or the word katagraphian, bitter things against me. So this scholar here said Jesus very well may have been confronting them with their own sins. And as they began to see him write things on the ground, and then he stood up and said, any of you that are without sin, they're probably like, oh, I'm leaving. <laughs> I don't want to be called out. So it's very likely um, but it says in there that they continued asking. So they were probably getting irritated. They wanted an answer from him. And so to me, this is an excellent example of how we as Christians should be slow to respond, slow to speak, stop and pray, ask God for that answer. That is something that I have really had to learn throughout my life. Um, so do what? Did you say I still haven't learned? Oh. <laughs> Jesus answers. Um, let whom was out? Who? Let him who was without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Without sin right there is the word um, anamartatos. I think I said that right. Which means um, not only without sin, but even without a sinful desire. So Jesus was saying, go ahead and stone her. Only if you have never wanted to do the same thing yourself. Those of you without the same sinful desires as her. And everybody left. So, you know... Um, so he was able to avoid the snare by neither reflecting on the law or by excusing the, women's, the woman's guilt. He simply spoke with authority and he spoke with truth. And in that, he avoided the trap that they were trying to set on him. So a Jesus principle here. Only those who are themselves without fault have the right to express judgment on the faults of others. Matthew 7, 1 tells us that. Matthew 7, 3 through 5 tells us that. Both of them talk about judging unless you want to be judged or pulling the log out of your own eye before you try to pull it out of your brother's. So it's very common for those that are in judgment in their own sin to be severe against the sin of others. And these Pharisees and scribes were very judgmental toward other people's sin, but to them they were perfect. Um, verse 11, Jesus did not condemn her. She was forgiven, but he also wanted her to know that he did not condone her um, actions. He said, I do not accuse or condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Sin like this no more. Jesus knows that we are human. We can't literally, I don't think it's possible for us to never ever sin. So sometimes he will literally go in and he'll call out a specific thing that we're doing that, we, that is separating us from him. And he'll tell us, you know, go, make a new start. Don't do that again. And that's pretty much what he's telling her here. You know, just don't go back into that same sin. So um, we'll get into verses 12 through 20 now. This argument is taking place in the temple of the treasury with the Jewish authorities. This is Jesus and the, the Jewish authorities going back and forth. And here in a minute, I'll explain to you the importance of that treasury. Verse 12, it says, Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk or be occupied in darkness. Darkness there means two things. In the Greek, it means dimness, not bright or a lack of light and not seeing clearly. And it also means obscurity, which is unimportant, not understood. So they're walking in darkness. They're dim. They don't understand the truth. Um, but uh, they, will have light, they will have the light of life, and that is uh, the word zoe, which is um, the absolute fullness of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, and I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So the treasury, this is um, the, it was in the court of women inside the temple. Oh, there it is. Um, so the treasury, let's see, it was, it was called uh, this because the women, the reason it was called the court of the women is because the women could not pass beyond this court unless they were going to offer a sacrifice. But the treasury, like this is the court of women. 
the treasury was off on, there was a treasury here and there was a treasury there. And as people would come into the treasury, they would drop. It was constantly busy with worshipers. They were constantly coming through all hours of the day. And they had these, what they called trumpets. They were upside down trumpets. The little part was here and it came down and then they went into these chests and people would walk by, you know, putting their ties. They had, I think there was um, 13 treasure chests in there, which people dropped their offerings. Each chest, I was not going through all of this, but each chest literally was for a different purpose. So they had to know what they were doing. There were so many different things and I was, it's crazy. I was just like, how would you, I would be so confused. I'd just have to go drop one in each one because I wouldn't know. Um, so the temple, tre- the temple treasury would clear- clearly be a busy place uh, with a constant flow of worshipers coming in and out, like I said before. One of the things that I wanted to point out um, before we get into his, um, the next I am message is, you remember when we talked about in John 4 how Jesus loves to play off of things? Um, he loves to use, I, I say he's like the king of props. You know, take the well, for instance. He goes to the well, he teaches on the living water. He fixes a good meal and, you know, the bread. And that is his, um, the bread of life, you know, statement. And so, we've, you know, you wonder sometimes, well, why did he choose the treasury or the court of the women to talk about I am the light? Well, this is a really cool thing I just learned. Um, on the evening of the first day of the Festival of Booths, there was a ceremony called the Illumination of the Temple. And it took place in the court of women. The court was surrounded with deep galleries, and in the center were four, it's uh, candelabras, candelabra, candelabra. And these were large, um, go back to the, is the candelabra one? These right here were literally like, I'm not going to get that right. This is what they say they look like. There was four of those, and they lit up all of those. And they say that during this festival right here, that the priests and, like, all of them would come in, and they would literally dance before the Lord while these were lit all night long. They would dance before the Lord on the steps. And then when the rooster crowed in the morning, they would put the fires out. But that fire, those candelabra labras, they literally went in. You can put that one back up of the actual lit up temple. They say that it lit up and it would literally light up like places in other temples, other areas of their of their uh, city. And that was like the flaming torch. This is where Jesus talks about how he is the light of the world so he's playing off of the blazing fire out of this this uh ceremony that they do which i thought was absolutely amazing so um they say that when dark came you know they were just i mean it literally inside the temple you literally couldn't tell it was dark anymore it was so so bright And so think about that whenever we're talking about the light of the world, that blazing fire that literally lit up the entire city. So um, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is revisiting the theme to the prologue of the book of John. Remember in John 1, 5, he said, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. We can see all throughout the word um, how those bound by religion, the Pharisees, the uh, scribes and stuff like that, how they literally could not comprehend the truth. They could not comprehend who Jesus was. They couldn't comprehend the life that he had. The word light there is the word phos, I believe that's how it's said, um, which is a ray, the ray to shine, a luminary fire, just like the candelabras that they would light. It's just, he's a fire. Um, Jesus is the light of the world. He was sent into the world to portray his father. Light also means, that same word also means to speak, to affirm, to declare, and to make manifest. So Jesus is also the voice of his father in this world. So he came to declare and affirm the truth. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the father except by me. And then he also came to manifest the living word, the living water, and the power of God. John 4, uh, 1 John 4, 9 says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, that we might live through him. So Jesus is saying here, as he's, you know, playing off of this, uh, it's like a light display is almost what you would think back in those days. Um, He says, You have seen the blaze of the temple of illuminations, piercing the darkness of night. I am the light of the world, and for anyone who follows me, there will be light, not only for uh, for one exciting night, but for your entire path of life. 
So that was, I'm sure that was, you know, that was, ah, that had to have been exciting to just be able to see that. Um, I want to take you here, though, Matthew 5, 14. Did you know that that is the same light as what we're talking about here? You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Jesus said that I, he, he said, I am the light of the world. He now dwells in each, inside each one of us. So now he has given us the mandate. We are the light of the world. And everything that we do, we are to be a light for him. So, you know, just think about that in every single day life. Um, we are here to declare the truth and manifest the love of God by being him to this world, by knowing the word and the truth, by walking in the power of, and the authority of the Holy Spirit. That is the only way that darkness is going to be exposed and overcome. So he said, whoever follows me, follow here in the Greek is the word um, akalathian, which um, has several different meanings. It's used of a soldier following his captain um, into battle or wherever his captain leads. Um, Christ is our captain. Um, it's used of accepting wise counsel and opinion, and we are guided by the counsel of Christ. It's also used in giving obedience to the laws of a, of a city or state, and we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. To be followers of Christ is to give body, soul, and spirit into obedience, and to follow him is to walk in the light. So um, verses 13 through 20 is um, pretty much Jesus' uh, the witness of himself. I have a word written here. I can't even read it. I can't read it. Anyways, so he's, he's, they're blaming him for trying to be a witness, you know, his own witness. So um, the Pharisees, they got very hostile and started to challenge Jesus on legal grounds um, because no man in a trial in the Jewish court was allowed to testify on his own behalf. He always, they always had to have somebody else there. So the rabbis had declared the name of the Messiah was the light. Um, if you go back and you look at the Old Testament in Psalms, Isaiah, Job, Micah, all of those areas, they talk about, they relate God to the light. So Jesus coming in and saying that I am the light of the world, he was actually claiming that there is none higher than him. He, knows, he knew how to, how to communicate with these people. <laughs> um, he was letting them know that his own witness was enough. He was so conscious of his own authority that no other witness was necessary. He was so aware of his closeness with his father that he needed no other authority for his claims than his own relationship with God. Jesus let them know that God was, was also his witness. Um, I love what Barclay says. He says, the witness of God is in Jesus' words, deeds, and the effect of Jesus upon men and women. None of this could be in him without God. So the cool thing is, is we carry that same thing. I love it. Um, I will try not to be more confrontational after I go through all of this. <laughs> I won't, I promise. Um, so, be, but because they couldn't see any of this, he pretty well blunt, he bluntly lets them know that they have no clue who God is. They have no clue of the knowledge of God. Um, in verse 19, they said, um, where is your father? And he answered, you do not know me or my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. I feel like Jesus didn't tolerate stupid very well. I just think he was probably just like, how many times am I going to have to repeat this, you know? And so um, <laughs> I think this is what's going through my head as I'm studying this, you know, I, it, put it in today's terms. Who's your daddy? And he said, you know, and he lets him know real quick, even if he was here, you wouldn't know who he was because you literally have no clue who I am. You know, you are still living in darkness. So these, these, Men just want to argue and argue, but they just cannot see what's in front of them. Um, verses 21 through 30. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below, and I am from above. You are of this world, and I am, uh, and I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I, he repeats that a lot, doesn't he? I mean, they, they just, they can't. Um, so they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world that I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, 
when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many of them believed in him. So that authority that he began to speak in, they began to, you know, they began to grasp that. In verses 21 and 22, of course, Jesus is explaining to them about him going away. He's referring to going to the Father, you know, his crucifixion and, and going to, to the Father. And when he is gone, they will realize what they've missed. And they're going to search, and they're not going to find him. And it's because of the darkness that they're living in, not understanding the truth, that they will die in their sin. This is the same thing that he was telling the people in John seven thirty four. You will seek me, and you will not find me. You will, uh, where I am, you cannot go. So, you know, he's telling them over and over. Um, but because of their continued disobedience and their refusal to accept him, they have pretty well cut God out of their lives in any understanding of what he's, you know, of who he is. And then the part about will he kill himself, you know, they began to talk about him killing himself because he said, where I'm going, you can't, you know, you can't go. Um, this was actually a mocking jest. Um, the Jewish thought that the depths of hell were reserved for those who took their own lives. And so according to Barclay, this could have been a grim blasphemy to Jesus. And um, they were saying, maybe he'll take his own life. You know, maybe he is on the way to the depths of hell. And that is for sure where we're not going. We will not follow him there. We can't follow him there, you know, because they were perfect. You know, so that very well could have been, you know, just that attack on him. So um, verses 23 and 24, Jesus is explaining to the Pharisees that they are from the earth and he is from heaven. And they are of the world and he is not of the world. The word world there is cosmos, um, the opposite of heaven. Jesus came from heaven into the world. John, like we've talked about in John 1, 9. The cosmos is the changing, transient life that we live. It is here. It is what we are living here. So he's trying to get them to understand, you know, that they have no clue what they're talking about. But because they refuse him, they're going to, they will die in their sin. And he j they just aren't grabbing a hold of that. Um, I, you guys will hear a lot of us talk about the Barclay book a lot. William, I think it's William Barclay. Um, it is absolutely phenomenal. Um, he had this little thing in here that got me because being a nurse, you talk medical to me and I can pretty much understand what you're saying so this is what he says he says into this world which was gone wrong which has gone wrong comes christ and christ comes with a cure he brings forgiveness he brings cleansing he brings strength and grace to live life as um, as it ought to be lived and to make the world what it ought to be but any of us can refuse a cure a doctor may tell a patient that a certain treatment is able to restore health and may even point out that the inevitable consequence of not accepting that treatment will be death this is precisely what Jesus was trying to say. If you do not believe in me, uh, that I am who I am, you will die in your sins. Ultimately, Jesus is the cure. And they, they just, I guess they just don't want to be well. Um, so, I mean, that, I loved how he put that. Um, verses 25 and 26, that's where Jesus is like, I have told you who I am when they ask him again. Um, sometimes I feel like he was probably so frustrated and, you know, as we learned in the verse, or in chapter 7, that Jesus does scream, you know, he did, it, he was crazo, right? Wasn't that the word, crazo? So, you know, he does get loud, so I'm feeling like he was probably like, I have told you, you know, and, um, and then that part, the one, <laughs> the part that says, um, I have much to say about you and much to judge, you know, do you think he was saying, you know, oh, do I ever have so many things I would love to say to you? You know, not so nice things, but, you know, because the Father is the one that I tells me what to speak, I have to speak what he says I will speak. You know, I, I'm not going to judge you, but I have much I could. You know, so that is just like, I'm sure he was just so, I don't know. Reading through this just showed me how confrontational and how, you know, he just, he wasn't going to let anything stop him from telling the truth. Um, verse 28, when you lift up the Son of Man, when you lift up that cross, you will have your suddenly. You will know immediately who I am. And, you know, I don't, I don't, would it have been too late? I've been trying to figure that out because he said you will die in your sin, but they would have had the chance to receive Christ right after that, <laughs> I would hope. Uh, but they would know. They were going to have their, their aha moment. Um, and then in verse 30, because of the truths that he spoke, many began to believe in him. So they have seen, they have believed, and they are about to receive. So um, let's go through our memory verse really quick. 
we're going to break this down big time. Um, so verses 31 and 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So we are going to um, just literally break it down, word, not word for word, but pretty close to that. So he said to the Jews who had believed. So the Jews are about to receive some major freedom. Um, discipleship begins with belief. It begins the moment we believe and accept Jesus Christ in our lives. That is one of the things in this church that we talk about over and over and over, and that is discipleship because that is our mandate on this earth is to disciple people who will disciple people who will disciple people, right? So discipleship begins with belief. Um, it says on there that the Jews who had believed him. And then he talks about if you abide in my word. The word abide there means um, it's the word mino, which is continue, remain, dwell, endure, literally stay in that word. Um, discipleship means constantly remaining in the word of God. And this involves several things. Um, one, listening to the word. You know, listen to it. If you have the, the chance, listen. Um, learning from Jesus. Disciple literally means the learner. And I read this quote right here, and it's one of y'all's uh, fill in the blanks, but this absolutely just, it's really stuck in my head. The shut mind is the end of discipleship. Think about that. When we get to the point where we think we've learned enough, our learning's over. I mean, our growth is over. The shut mind is the end of discipleship. Um, the third one, constant searching into the truths of the word, going deeper, what we're doing here. You know, not just reading that surface level of the word, but understanding what he is saying. That is so vital. And then the constant obeying of the word. You know, when you get that word in you, just that knowing the truth, knowing what sh you should do, hearing the Holy Spirit, and then obeying what he's telling you to do. That is, that is very, you know, very, very important. Um, and the means of remaining in the word of God. And, you know, what... I was thinking about this earlier when I was reading over it. How can you remain in the Word? I mean, you take your Bible and, like, walk around all day and just, like, talking to people. But, you know, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what he's saying is continually remaining. The only way you're going to do that is by memorizing and by knowing the Word. And so that is, you know, the reason why we're pushing you guys to memorize because you need to be constantly remaining in that Word 24-7. Um, the, third, the third point, discipleship issues in the knowledge of truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth. So going back a little bit, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. The word know there is um, gnos gnosko. It's understand. Um, that sounds to me the opposite of darkness, Right? Darkness is not understanding. So that is the light that will illuminate you is knowing the word. Um, and, you, and so the more you know, the more you're, just, the more you're lit up for his kingdom. Um, the truth, what is the truth? John 14, 6 says, I, Jesus Christ, am the way, the truth, and the life. In the truth of Jesus, we will see what is really important and what is not in our lives. By getting in his word and knowing his word and abiding in his word, we will learn what is important and what should be done in our lives. It is literally our roadmap for life. Um, the next one, the last one, discipleship results in freedom. And the last part of that verse, and the truth will set you free. So those who had believed in him, he said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Um, the word free here, freeborn, unrestrained, to be at liberty. What are we? Liberty Church. What has Pastor been preaching on for the past several weeks? Freedom, right? So we will be free from the dominion of sin. In his service is perfect freedom. In his service, doing things, being a disciple for him is perfect freedom. Um, Barclay speaks of four areas of freedom that discipleship brings. The first one, I love this because it's exactly what Pastor just taught on. It's the freedom from fear. Um, Matthew 28.10 says, you know, Jesus told them to dismiss all fear and go, right? After 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to get it. <laughs> so after the resurrection, he said, do not fear anymore. Now go. So freedom, being a disciple and knowing his word brings that true freedom and that freedom from fear. Um, walk, we walk forever in the company of Jesus. And in that company, fear is gone. Amen? All right. So the second one, freedom from self. The power and the presence of Jesus can recreate us until we are all together new. Freedom from selfishness, freedom from self-indulgences, freedom from, gosh, just all the things that we allow ourselves to hold us back from. You know, there's so many things that, that we ourselves, we blame it on other things, but it's just us that hold us back. You know, so it, freedom from that and it, to, it, the freedom to run with what he's told us to do. Um, the next one, freedom from other people. How many of us have not done things because we're afraid of what somebody may think or what somebody's going to say about us or what they have said about us or, I mean, so many things. Disciples are people who are no longer dominated by what others may say or think about them because they think only of what their God says, right? Yeah. And the next one, freedom from sin. Sin is to miss the mark, be mistaken, to wander from the path of uprightness and to not be offended. That's a hard one, <laughs> to not be offended. But we have freedom from that. We do not have to be offended. We don't have to miss the mark. Um, Romans 6.14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you are under grace. Discipleship breaks the chains that bind us to old life of sin and enables us to be the persons we know we ought to be. So um, when we are disciples, and we're getting in the word, and we're desiring the word, and we're like just totally just like soaking it in, we no longer have a desire to sin. And if we are, we need to go back and we need to see, where am I not, in all these steps, what am I not doing? Am I not abiding? Am I not, you know, finding my scriptures? So out of these freedoms, you know, these freedoms come from believing, knowing, and abiding. So if this is my encouragement to you guys. If you struggle in any area of any of the things that we've talked about, stop and reassess. What am I not doing? Am I not believing? Am I not abiding? You know, am I not um, knowing what I'm, you know, getting into? You know, like with the word and stuff. So, you know, reassess that. So let's do our memory verse again. You ready? So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Woo! That's good. All right. So now, you guys should not ever be able to forget that memory verse, because we really broke that thing down. Amen? All right. So starting in 33, they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and, never, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will become free? They are so bound. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So Jesus' talk of freedom really rubbed them the wrong way. Because to the Jews, they put a very big value on freedom. Um, all of their law says that no Jew must descend to the level of ever being a slave. They literally could never be a slave to anything. That was in their law. And so for them to say that they were nobody's slaves, they were actually really holding tight to a fundamental law that they had, to their creed, their creed of life. Um, and in their mind, of course, you know, they're thinking physical slavery. They, don't, they have no clue about spiritual, what Jesus is speaking spiritually. But Jesus is speaking spiritually. He's talking about the slave being slaves to sin, as we saw on here. So everyone who practices sin or is a slave to sin, there are, they are slaves to the habits that grip them, to the self-indulgences that dominate their lives, the wrong pleasures which have taken hold of them. These Jews were literally slaves to the sin of religion um, and the rules and the indulgences, indulgences that had dominated their lives and kept them from recognizing who Jesus was. They were so enslaved to that old mindset and not understanding the truth. Um, he talks about the son remaining and the slave that does not. In effect, Jesus is saying to the Jews, you think you are sons in God, in God's house, and that nothing can ever banish you from him, but by your conduct, you are making yourselves slaves, and the slave can be ejected from the master's presence at any time. 
you know they didn't like to hear that. So what do they do next? They pretty much, I think this is where they pretty much tell Jesus he's a demon, I think. Um, Verse 37 through uh, 41, I know that you are the, oh, this is where Jesus is talking to him. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen my, with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would not be doing the works, or you would be doing the works um, Abraham did. Remember, Abraham was considered a righteous man and a man of faith. So, um, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth and that heard it from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works of your father. They said to him, um, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. So I'm sure to them it's like, ouch, this is some really harsh conversation. Jesus is really telling them their business. Um, so here Jesus and the Jews are still at issue. He's setting, he sets himself to convince and convert them while they still have themselves set to contradict and oppose him. Um, so pretty much Jesus is affirming that they are the offspring of Abraham. Um, to them, Abraham was one of the greatest figures in all religious history, but they do not carry out the same character as Abraham did. The word tells us in James, Galatians, Romans, that Abraham believed God and was counted as righteous. And in Hebrews 11, it says that through faith, Abraham obeyed God. So he was a, also a man of faith. This is not the character of these religious people who, can, who claim to be the sons of Abraham. Um, even Galatians 3, 7 says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So were these Pharisees at all you know, portraying the character of Abraham? Not at all. Um, it is all rules and religion for them. A real descendant of Abraham would have acted as he acted, and that's what Jesus is telling them. Seeking to kill him is the opposite of Abraham's actions. If you think back in Genesis, Abraham saw the angels under the tree. He went and invited them in, and he had Sarah cook for them. You know, he, he you know, encouraged the messengers of God. He took care of the messengers of God. Well, these people are trying to kill the messenger of God. They don't want anything to do with his truth. And so that is the total opposite conduct of Abraham. So he says, you do the works of your father. The works, their works had revealed their true kinship. People can prove their kinship to God by their conduct and their character. So think about that when you're around town. People can tell whose child you are by your conduct or your character. Um, starting in 41, again, we're going to kind of repeat 41. It says, you are doing the works your father did. And they said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord. He sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my words. Um, you are uh, of your father the devil, and your will is to do the father's desires. Uh, he, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not, stand on, does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Um, in verse 41, he talks, they say, we were not born of sexual immorality. Several of the commentaries I read said that there actually had been um, rumors, you know, since the beginning that uh, Mary had cheated on Joseph, you know. I mean, I'm sure. Think about it. And so they were actually coming back at him with those rumors is what a lot of them said. They were pretty much just trying to throw a sneer at him a little bit to see if they could make him angry. Um, they said, we are not illegitimate children, but you are. Okay. So um, it's possible, you know, that that, that was going on. Um, so Jesus, I mean, what it said in there, what, several of the things that I read was that they thought that the gossip had probably gone on for many, many years. So alleging that um, he had been conceived out of wedlock is what they were doing. So Jesus informs them, if God truly were your father, then, you know, you would have loved me because I came from him. I didn't ask to come and die for you. He sent me, you know. So he's just counteracts them with, hey, you know, I am who I am. So the key of the gospel of John, the real test is how people react to Jesus. Will they see? Will they believe? Will they receive him? And um, in verses 44 and 45, Jesus is pretty much letting them know that they aren't understanding because like we learned before in the beginning, they live in darkness. Their sight has been dimmed to the truth. They can't see it 
or understand it because they have fallen prey to the father of lies, the deception of religion, laws, and ignorance of the word. These guys had just completely fallen prey. He mentions two characteristics of the devil. He says he's a murderer. The, through the devil, sin entered the world, and through sin came death. The devil murders goodness, honor, honesty, beauty. He, um, all, that's, all that makes life good. He murders peace of mind, happiness, love. He just destroys everything. That's what he's here for. He's a liar. Falsehood always hates the truth and tries to destroy it. Jesus said the Jewish leaders were children of the devil because their thoughts were bent on the destruction of the good and maintaining the false. They just wanted to destroy him and keep their false beliefs. Um, so they were the, the children of the father of lies. Um, verses 40, oh gosh, um, I'm, we'll get through this. Um, verses 46 through 50, which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of, of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks me, and he is the judge. So stop and imagine that scene for a minute. Jesus stops him and says, who can convict me of doing anything wrong? And you can almost hear the silence, right? Like, they can't. He's done nothing wrong. And so after that, he's like, then if I tell the truth, why, are you, why do you want to kill me? You know, he just, he's, why do you want to do that? And then he's saying, you know, whoever is of God hears the words of God. John 10, 27 tells us that my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They had come, become so bound by religion that they had cut off the Spirit of God, and they could no longer hear his voice. And then Jesus begins to tell them, you know, that their father is the devil. So what are they going to do? You have a demon, and you're a Samaritan. A Samaritan was considered a heretic. A Samaritan was considered a lawbreaker. They were an enemy of Israel. But what I think is hilarious is they're trying to make Jesus mad, but do they realize a few chapters back, the Samaritans actually know who their father is, and they're still trying to figure it out. So Jesus is like, I already took care of them. He has no worries. He doesn't care if he's called a Samaritan. So, you know, I mean, it's just like they know. They, they already knew. So it doesn't bother him at all. Verse 50, Jesus knew um, that while he was on this earth, he was going to be persecuted and he was going to be rejected. But he also knew that his father would protect his honor and that eventually he would be in glory with his father. And so he's, you know, just kind of reaffirming that. Um, 51, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you, the, are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Can you hear him just like totally attacking him? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I did not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. This, the claims that, um, the, that those who keep his word will never see death absolutely infuriated the Jews. Um, they looked to Abraham and the prophets as, you know, they followed the word. They were in the word. They knew the word, and they died. So they're like, you are such a liar, you know. But... Um, they didn't like Jesus setting himself above Abraham or any of the prophets. But, of course, we know that Jesus was talking about a spiritual, not a physical death. Um, but they still, of course, were not able to understand that. In um, 54, Barclay says, It is not difficult to honor oneself when Jesus talks about glorifying himself. He said, It's not difficult to honor oneself. In fact, it's uh, fatally easy. To bask in the sunshine of one's own approval, and the world will honor anyone who is successful. But the real honor is the honor which eternity can reveal. So the real honor is the life that we live. You know, how, how will we be in, in the end of it? Um, in 55, Jesus is claiming a unique knowledge of God. He knows him and will not back down. And he is also claiming a unique obedience to God, something that nobody else could do. Um, the Number 15, it says, to look at Jesus is to be able to say, this is how God wishes me to live. And to look at his life is to say, this is serving God. So, um, and then, almost done, guys. 56, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? 
Jesus said to, him, to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The Jews did believe that Abraham, while he was still alive, had a vision of the, of, um, of the history of Israel and the coming of the Messiah. They did believe that. And so when Jesus said that Abraham had seen his day, the vision, um, he was making a deliberate claim that he was the Messiah, and that made them mad. Um, when they asked about why 50, 50 was the age that the Levites retired. So to them, they were saying, you are literally still in your prime. You're not even old enough to retire yet. And you're trying to tell us you've seen Abraham. I mean, really? But they have, you know, they're just, they have no clue. Um, and then Jesus talks about before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say, I was. He said, I am. This is his claim that he is timeless. We know that, Je that the human Jesus was born and died so what is he meaning? There is only one person in the universe who is timeless, and that one person is God. What Jesus is saying here is that nothing less than the life in him is the life of God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Jesus, the eternal God showed himself to men and women everywhere. So that made him pretty mad. He almost got rocks chunked at him. He ducked and he ran. And that's the end of that one. All right, so let's go over memory verse one more time. We have some discussion questions. It is 8.05. You guys will give you 10 minutes on the discussion questions. Memory verse. You guys ready for it? So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And why did we use the word hate for eight? because <laughs> they were being hateful <laughs> that's right they are mean okay guys discussion questions on the back of your paper number five is a personal question it's not something i would probably expect you guys to do with the group so that would be one i would encourage you to do at home um if you're watching online you can see them up there on the screen all right 10 minutes guys all right you guys Ready to wrap it up? All right, who has some answers for me? Let me get me a paper here. Who wants to, who wants to run my mic? Anybody? That he does, he's doing that so he doesn't have to answer. <laughs> All right, let's go, with, um, let's go with this table right here. Um, what does it mean to abide? Did you guys get an answer there? <laughs> You're a teacher. You can talk. Uh, I know. Um, Just imagine we're a bunch of third graders. <laughs> yeah. So we put to saturate, to marinate, be obedient, memorize it, live it, do it, not be a part of the world, not be of the world. Um, we even talked about taking it in. She mentioned... Um, taking it in during your private time in the morning and then to live it throughout the day mm -hmm. that That's God good. will give you, you know, parts of what's going to happen in your day and you live, live that throughout the day. That's good. I like that. Anybody else want to throw in on that one? Oh, please. Could you go check his paper, make sure it's really written on there? Uh, the second one, the truth. What is the truth? Who wants to go with that one? Everybody answered that one. That's easy. All right. So this was, this was what we were talking about at this table over here. How does knowing the truth set you free? Anybody want to take that one? I'm going to pick somebody if you don't. All right, Russ. We actually, we, we actually never got to that question. <laughs> no, but I'll answer it for you. How does knowing the truth set you free? Well, um, you begin, you begin operating. Uh, if you're operating in the Word of God, uh, you're operating in the will of God. And once you start getting in line with God your life is going to come into order uh, with God and with 
with his way of doing things and his way of doing things is always the best way to do things because it, it usually works out right mm -hmm. that's good that's really good what that's did you say that one more time i know i need to write that down but i'll have a pen somebody write that down for me all right, I, I shared this scripture with him, Isaiah 55, where, where, where uh, the prophet said, or God says, My ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts, but as the heavens are higher above the earth, so are my ways and thoughts higher than your thoughts. It's just taking the picture that God, the way God thinks and does things is far above the way we normally do stuff. But the, the, the scripture continues, says, But... As the rain comes down from heaven and the snow and waters the earth and makes it bring forth bud, so shall my words be. Uh, they shall not return to me void. In other words, the, the word of God is going to put your, as we put it into ourselves, will begin to operate on a, a higher level on God's thoughts and God's ways. And things are going to work out uh, much better in our lives because we're getting in tune and harmony with the will of God for our lives. Ooh, I want that phrase. Mm, that's the good. Phrase, the phrase the word said. of God, yeah, brings the will of God. Obedience to the word of God brings. Uh, yep. Knowing the word of God. Okay. Yep. All right. And then Isaiah what, Russ? What's the scripture? Isaiah 55. It's in there. Isaiah 55 in that chapter. Not sure about the verse, but yeah. Okay. okay. And then are we on number four? Okay, what does it mean to know the truth? Any takers on that? We could pick pick either this table or that one way over there. Or Judy or Stacy or somebody there. Judy's, Judy's holding her hand up. Judy's reaching out. To go along with what Russ said, you know, being in his word and abiding in his word and knowing the Father's, it's, that intimate relationship with with God and understanding His love. Um, so, you want to read some scriptures? I was also here. <gasps> I was I was looking at yeah. that. Yeah. Gotcha. Yes. Would you like to share anything about what does it mean to know the truth? Mm-hmm relationship yeah exactly yeah that's right and, that's the truth. and it will set you free <laughs> all right that's it guys the last one you guys can work on at home together um and or not together sorry at home alone i'll get it right one of these days yeah with God, together with God. That's where I was headed. Thanks, Judy. <laughs> All right. Don't jump up yet. I'll pray you guys out here in just a second. Thank you. All right, let's pray, guys. Father God, we thank you so much for all of this truth that has been planted deep inside of us, Father. We just ask that you continue to just let it marinate. Um, let us continue to just study this, um, this word, the things that we've, you know, that everybody's written down, Father God, to take it home and just study and study and study and study, Father God, and just to abide in that, Father. Father God, I just pray for a hunger to come upon every person here, Father God, that, that they have that hunger to abide, God. And Father God, and I thank you that in abiding in your word, Father God, and in knowing you and in believing in you, Father, that we are your disciples, Father. And in knowing your truth, Father God, we are free, Father. We give you all the glory, all the honor, in Jesus' name, amen.